In this complete relative stamina training session from Range of Motion Individualized Programming, the athletes will be completing 100 pull-ups and 100 ring dips. Every time they need to break one movement, they will add a minute time penalty to their total time and switch movements. The athletes will scale these movements so they're able to perform somewhere between 20 and 30 repetitions of each movement in that first set. So firstly, let's explore the programming science behind this session. This is obviously focused on upper body relative stamina. That is the fatigue resistibility of the upper body. We are coupling together two movements, one that is more pull based in the pull up and one which is more press based in the ring dip. So although there is an overlap in terms of some of the muscle groups being used, in particular the stabilizers, we do have a little bit of respite as you're recovering from those pull ups, working on those dips and vice versa. And although we are getting some recovery in the muscle groups, there is a bit of an overlap in terms of the energy systems being used. So although your muscles are recovering and that more peripheral fatigue is recovering, the ability to deliver energy to the muscles and to be able to remove waste from the muscles, alternating between these muscle groups means that there is a blood shunting effect which does cause a cardiorespiratory benefit. So there is an improvement here in work capacity as well as in that relative stamina. Now this session dangles a bit of a carrot in front of the athletes because there is an incentive to do larger sets. Larger sets mean less of those one minute time penalties and a greater overall score. But because of this, the athlete is incentivized to push closer to failure. So what does this push towards failure do? Well, it creates a very high degree of motor unit activation. What this means is we are turning on a lot of those nerves which turn on the muscle fibers to create a muscle contraction. As you're doing exercise, your muscle fibers can either be turned on or off, and these motor units can either be on or off. We can't half turn them on. So as we push towards failure, we are innovating and turning on a larger number of these motor units, which means that it's gonna really challenge the recoverability of the athletes, but also train that recoverability. And anytime you're pushing towards failure like this, it will leave you feeling like you've done a lot more than 100 reps of each movement. This can be a great training strategy to get a really good training effect without having to do hours of training to achieve it. So what are the benefits of this session to your health and to your body composition? Well, because we are doing very high repetitions of a movement, this is not the most effective session to improve strength or power. However, as we've already mentioned, it has a very powerful effect in terms of improving the ability of that individual, of that athlete, to resist fatigue. So fatigue resistibility is one of the big benefits here. From a cardiovascular risk factor point of view, often a lot of the cardiovascular exercises that we do in our training are more based around the lower body, things like running and cycling and rowing. What this can do, however, is create an environment in the upper body where it's not evolved and it's not adapted to be able to meet some of these cardiorespiratory demands. So this is a really effective way of building some cardiovascular health through the upper body to reduce a lot of the risk factors of cardiac disease. And in terms of the benefits to blood chemistry, we can see favorable adaptations with things like cholesterol levels, our lipids, triglycerides, and blood pressure. Now, in terms of the effect of body composition here, although this is a session which is not biased primarily towards cardiorespiratory endurance, and therefore the energy output is not super high, the fact that we are doing a considerable amount of muscle damage here as we're pushing our body towards failure multiple times over this session means that we get a high degree of EPOC, that is excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. What this means is after you finish training, the energy expenditure doesn't stop. It can continue for an extended period of time from the end of that session. Let's move now on to performance benefits. And the big benefit here, as we've already talked about in the health benefits, is the ability of our muscles to resist fatigue. Although we can't change the numbers of different types of muscle fibers in our body, we can improve the efficiency of a certain muscle fiber. So the high repetitions here and the need to be continuing these contractions during fatigue will really improve the efficiency of those slow twitch muscle fibers and build a high degree of peripheral stamina in the body. Plus, as a result of the high number of contractions, we're actually increasing the amount of mitochondria in our muscles. This is basically the little fuel cells inside a cell which allows us to complete these muscle contractions. By increasing the mitochondria, we're increasing the ability to resist fatigue, which improves the stamina of our muscles even further. And we get further fatigue resistance by increasing the density of the capillaries in the muscles that we are using. We have more capillaries, we have more capacity to be able to deliver nutrients and fuel to our muscles and to be able to remove waste products from our muscles. 
And although this session is not designed with cardio respiratory training as its primary benefit, the ordering and patterning of these movements where we're shunting blood between different muscle groups means there will be a cardiovascular benefit. This improves things like cardiovascular endurance, the function of your respiratory system, improvements in intramuscular substrate storage, which basically increases the energy we have for muscle contractions, and increased enzyme activities, which basically increases the speed at which we can deliver fuel to our muscles. So let's talk strategy to be able to get the most out of this session and to be able to finish it in the shortest amount of time possible. Now, it is key to remember here that your time for this is not the time it took you to complete the 100 reps of each movement, but the time it takes you to complete these 200 reps plus any of the time penalties. So again, there's an incentive or a carrot being dangled here. How far do you push? How much can you risk early on to try and ensure that we minimize these time penalties? Now, if you think about it, what this means is you are better off resting for 55 seconds if it means you have one less rest than having a zero second rest and putting the extra break in there and getting that 60 second time penalty. Now, as much as possible, you wanna be trying to keep each of these movements on track with each other. So if you're able to do 25 pull-ups, you should also be able to do 25 ring dips. The issue arises when one of these movements gets ahead of the other you come to the end and you've maybe got 30 dips remaining, your pull-ups are done, which means that you're then constantly working on that pressing muscle group, which is really gonna impair your performance and increase the number of rests that you need, therefore increase your time penalties and damage your total score. As a good take-home piece of strategy with this one, you should be aiming to reach approximately 75 to 90% of your max predicted reps in each set. If you go to absolute failure, you won't be able to recover because once you hit that wall, you can't recover from hitting that wall. But if we can stop just below that point, just below the point where you're having to recruit all of these motor units, you should be able to maintain a decent number in each set. Let's talk about the feeling you should be getting from this session. This is very much a localized muscular fatigue. You're not gonna be limited by your breathing. You're not gonna be limited by your strength you're going to be limited by the fatigue resistibility of the muscles in question. Of course, this is a great thing because it also means we train this fatigue resistibility, but expect a lot of muscle burning with this, expect a lot of that acid feeling in the muscles, and expect to be more limited by the ability of your muscles to keep contracting than anything else. A quick one here on scaling guidelines, you need to scale the difficulty of this so you can be achieving 20 to 30 reps of each movement in that first set. If you can only complete five, you're gonna end up with so many time penalties and it's gonna be so much rest that this session is going to train your localized muscular strength. It's your relative strength as opposed to the relative stamina that we are looking to train. So you can be quite aggressive in scaling with this, maybe more scaling than you would at first think because once you do start to get close to failure, it's gonna be very hard to keep these set numbers at 10 or higher, which is ideally what we wanna be looking for. So if you are looking to improve your body weight, your calisthenic, your gymnastic movements, this is a great way to do it. There is a super high level of muscle recruitment because of that fatigue and because of that desire to push close to failure on each set. It dangles that carrot, it takes away the ability to overpace and over strategize with this. You do have to be a little aggressive. There are times when you're gonna to have to hold on and remember, in the end, we're looking for your total best time. Not the time to complete the 200 reps, but those time penalties improved as well. If you want to improve your relative stamina, this is a great place to start.